The scripture reading this morning comes from Romans 8, 26 through 30. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And he searches the hearts of men, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that in everything God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Craig. He said he might read it in Greek, uh, but he did it in English. Good job. All right. I've got notes. I always do. Because I want to be accurate uh, with what I am teaching. And I would like for you to, uh, to think, take notes when you can. And, and to do your, your best in, in being able to learn what the Word of God is saying in such a way that you could share it with somebody else. So you know, there's going to be some definitions today and so forth, and I want you just to be thinking about that. If you don't have your Bible with you, pull out a pew Bible, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 26 through 30. Before I, I get into uh, my notes, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to tell you a story. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, you caused these scriptures to be written for our learning. We ask you to come and to be our teacher through the words that I'm offering and through the receptivity and the welcome of those words in everyone's hearts and minds. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So once upon a time, there was a dad and, and his little boy. The dad was a ball player, baseball player. Loved the sport, played it a lot, experienced winning seasons, losing seasons, health, injury, all the stuff that goes into to being an active baseball player. And he was waiting to see if his son was going to show an interest in the sport. And he did. And the dad used to go out and, and you know, throw him little pitches, let him get used to swinging that bat, you know. One day, the boy asked his dad to come out and to, uh, you know, hit with him. And the dad said, okay, I, I'm going to, let, let me pitch to you. And the, and the boy said, no, 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 I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch. You know, and so he, he takes that ball and he throws it up and he swings and he misses, picks it up again, throws it up swings and he misses and he does this several times and finally his dad's like son you want to be a little you want a little help with that (laughs) and he said dad am I going to be a great pitcher or what (laughs) and his dad's like man you are going to be a great ball player and I'm going to help you. Okay. So I just want to tell that little story. A kid swinging. Believing in what he's going to become. And all of us knowing it's the dad who's going to make that possible. Right? Okay. That's good. That's good. Now let's begin thinking about Romans Again. Now, every Sunday, there are always people who have not been a part of the sermon series or who have missed parts. So that's why I like to do a little recapping. The church in Rome, to whom Paul was writing, was not a big church. Not at all. Don't think of the Vatican. Think just the opposite. Think of little house churches, small groups of people squeezed into someone's basement or attic or into a little room behind a shop. Each of them daring to place their faith, their lives and their faith, in 
the crucified and risen rabbi called Jesus. It is to this little church that Paul has taken such pains to write a magnificent letter. And in it, he recounts mankind's rejection of the one true God and the impossibility of us being made right with God with our religious rule following. And the wondrous gift of the gospel, whereby God mercifully bridged the relationship gap by offering the life of his perfect son as an atonement for sin, making those who trust in him unguilty, unguilty in the courts of heaven. Now, not only were believers not guilty, they were invited into a life of utter confidence, of faith, of trust in God's grace. They received the spirit of adoption, Just like a faithful slave or servant could be adopted by a Roman citizen and have his name changed and his debts paid off and become a family member and an heir, so those who lived by faith in Jesus were adopted, brought into God's faith family and trained, and this letter is part of the training, in the family's business of reconciling and restoring God's people and God's creation back to God. We believe the letter arrived in Rome in the year 57. Maybe it was 58. They, the church, would meet its author two or three years later. Not a surprise because he told them he was eager to meet them. But they did not know and how could they know that the Apostle Paul would be imprisoned there and then freed and then imprisoned again later and then executed in Rome, in their home city, along with the Apostle Simon Peter within seven or eight years. Just imagine all the ups and downs, the joys and the sorrows of that. Did such sorrow negate or cancel Paul's insight that God works all things together for those who love him? Not at all. For in just over 200 years, the proud, decadent Roman Empire would in large part acknowledge the lordship of their crucified and risen rabbi, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Rome itself would become one of the great centers of the Christian faith. So why am I telling you this history? Well, because I think history matters. And because I want you to see the truth that Paul wrote about. That believers and followers of Jesus Christ have every reason to live in complete and utter confidence that God is at work in every circumstance to bring about His glorious purposes. So this sermon is called Complete and Utter Confidence. Our first reason to have complete and utter confidence is the spiritual. So let's reflect on the spirit. Verse 26 says, Likewise, the spirit helps us, God's adopted sons and daughters, in our weakness. For, for example, we do not know how to pray as we ought, but... The Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And he, our Father, who searches the hearts of men and women, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, that's God's holy ones, according to the will of God. And you might think, well, I'm not one of the holy ones. I'm talking about you, not me. Do you realize that Paul always addressed the recipients of his letters as the holy ones of God, as his saints? Even when he was so disappointed and so mad at the Corinthians, he kept on addressing his, letter, his letters to the saints, to the holy ones, because that's what God calls us and calls us into. 
Well, what is Paul saying about the Spirit and our prayers? <clears throat> He's saying that our prayers, if we pray sincerely, are informed by heaven's prayers. Think about that. Especially if we pray as we do on earth as it is in heaven. As we were taught, our prayers are formed, informed by heaven's prayers. And if we pray, not my will, but thy will be done, our prayers are linked with heaven's. And even if we're not sure how to pray or what to pray for, our openness and our longing for God's will to be done moves upon us. Because sometimes we get this idea that, you know, I, I know I need to pray. I should pray. This is really important. <clears throat> but we don't really have much spiritual feeling about that. You know what I'm talking about? I need to pray, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not in the mood. <laughs> I'm, not feeling, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling necessarily aligned with God. Well, you know, you want to do something. I think you ought to take a minute to be quiet and just get your own thoughts and feelings centered a little bit and then wait on the Lord with a little worship in your heart. You know, little words of praise and honor and remembering what he's done for you. And then you might want to remember the ministry of the Holy Spirit that Paul's talking about which kind of stirs up the spirit. And then lean into your praises a little more. Remember what God has done. Not just one thing, but, you know, maybe two or three big ones, little ones. And express your love and thanks for him, for his mercies. Read or recall his word, its truth. Get quiet on the inside, but also begin to focus on God and I think you will discover something. Before much time at all, the Spirit will be praying in you. And then through you. You'll find some words that feel like a real genuine offering to God. So remember the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Stir up the Spirit. Lean in. Remember what God's done. Express all of this. Paul had to do that. Even Paul. A couple of examples. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul asked three times that, he, that this thorn in his flesh, whatever it was, would be removed. Finally, it was revealed that the thorn, which was something painful to Paul that he didn't want to spell out in that letter, it was revealed that that thorn had a purpose and it was to humble him because he was a man of great learning and great power and had great visions of God and cause him to lean all the more on God's grace. Paul didn't know that, realize that the whole time the thorn was digging in his flesh but that came to him as the Spirit helped him to pray. Another time while in prison, Paul wasn't sure whether to pray. I mean, this is, the guy was in prison a lot <laughs> and often going without. And he wasn't sure whether to pray to die and to go and be with Christ Jesus, which, I mean, he really was very willing to do or to continue his ministry. He waited for the Spirit to help him. And it appears in his letter as he relates all of this that the Spirit urged him to persevere in ministry. That now was not the time. <clears throat> so today, after the sermon, when we get to prayer time, I want to <clears throat> invite you to, to, to pray. And I, then I want you to kind of go deep and wordless. I want you to sigh. Let your heart Sigh. 
I want you to avail the wordless depth of your heart and your spirit to God and wait for that still, silent, gentle voice to speak into you a good word to pray. Think you might try that? I'll remind you when we get there. It's a comfort to acknowledge that when we don't know precisely how to pray or what to pray for, the counselor that Jesus spoke of in John 16, 17 comes to our aid and in perfect intercession. So that's reason number one for our great and utter confidence. We have a spiritual connection with heaven and the Holy Spirit is our friend. <clears throat> okay, reason number two for our confidence is the good promised outcome. <clears throat> Verse 28 says, We know that in everything God works for good for those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. Now this is one of the best known texts in all the Bible, right? A lot of you all know this one. It's comforted and it's reassured believers down through the ages. It's been likened to a pillow upon which we can rest our weary and worried heads. I like to think of it as the morning star that points and pulls us through the last leg of a long night. There are two things about this verse that are vital <clears throat> for us to understand and sometimes don't make it into the translations or paraphrases. <clears throat> two things that are not always clear. First, <clears throat> God, do we have this on a slide? God, yes, God is the one who causes the good outcomes. Okay, so sometimes it, the sentence begins, all things work together. I want to make sure you know that it is God, our Father, who causes the good outcomes. The, it's not a formula baked into the universe. All things and everything do not <clears throat> simply work themselves out. To believe that is naive. It's God, our Father, who is the artist here. Our Father, who is at work here. Our Father, who loves us and makes sure that everything that comes our way will work for good <clears throat> in the end. Not the things themselves. He's doing that. Second vital thing is that he does this not just for those who love him. He's doing it with those who love him. This great assurance is being worked out with us. He appreciates the faith we contribute. Our faith is part of the recipe, though he is the cause and the power. He works with our trust in Him and our desire to see a good thing work out on earth as it is in heaven. So once again, God is the great cause and we are the cooperators. But I'm reiterating, it simply is not true that everything works out in the end for everybody. Though I've heard that dozens of times. That's not biblical. The promise is for those who love God, who have heard His call, and are serving His purposes. Got it? Okay. Now, it's true, several of our translations begin with all things work together for good <clears throat> instead of in everything God works for good. So they must have a reason for that. Why are they saying <clears throat> all things first? I'm going to cough real good here. See, that worked, that worked out good. Why do they begin with all things? It's, it, it is important that we do get this point. All things. All things in your life, all things in mine. So many things happen in our life that we have little control over, that we aren't really ready for, that we don't know what to do with. They appear to not fit into the life that we have been imagining that God had in mind for us. Are our lives over? Are our best days behind us? No. 
all things work together for good, Paul says. And the word all in the biblical languages means just what it means in English. It just, it means all. Everything. We should ask ourselves this morning, what has been happening or what has happened? Maybe something going on right now in our life that just came out of left field that, that feels wrong or overwhelming and you don't know how you're going to handle it. Does this belong in the category of all things, of everything? Yes. So we want to be like a little child this morning hearing the words of our good Father in heaven saying to us, even this I will work for good. It's going to be all right. And you ask how, and the Father says, because I'll make it so. Okay? All right. Now, I want to engage your imaginations just a little bit right now. Imagine going into a great house. Great big house. And there's a huge family picture, kind of like the Carters or Hanson, something like that, even bigger. Oh, my. <clears throat> And the man of the house says, these are all my adopted kids. And you're like, really? What, are you Ugandan or something? I mean, wow, all these are adopted? And the father says, yep, I knew each one of them long before I chose and adopted them. I knew everything there was to know about them and where they came from. And when I adopted them, I gave them a room, a place to live, an education, and a job in the family business that was just waiting for them to grow into. The moment I adopted them, I put them into my will, even though I knew full well that sometimes they would not do my will. But here's the thing. My one true son is the president of my company, and he always does my will, and he's in charge of the adopted kids and he's the model and the inspiration for them all. Now, if you get that into your mind, then what Paul writes next will make more sense. Verse 29. For those whom he, the Father, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he, the Son, might be the firstborn among many Brethren, that's brothers and sisters. Verse 30. And those whom he, the Father, predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. All these powerful verbs, you'll notice, are in the past tense. Why is that? It's because God is eternal. And he's prescient. And he's already fully made up his mind about those who love and believe in his son. So let me talk about four of these powerful action verbs. The first one is, is, is this. Okay, we're not going to get too complicated. For new. What does that mean? It means he knows us now and he always has known us. Number two, predestined. He has chosen and called us into a great destiny, predestined into a destiny and a destination. What is that? To be like Christ and with Christ. That's our destiny. Almost everyone I've ever known has a story or many stories of not being chosen, of not getting to go somewhere fun but others got to of not being picked for a team, of not being given a job that you applied for, of not turning out to be the one that he or she married. And, you know, that hurts. It is part of life. Not chosen carries the blunt message of rejection and of not having the precise hmm, place that we thought we did. Maybe we didn't have this quite the same value to someone that we had hoped we had. But the Bible says that every single believer 
is known and chosen. That's how we're supposed to regard ourselves. Chosen, called, and predestined to be like Christ and with Christ. Any, any of y'all been watching The Chosen? Of course you have. Anybody else think that it was strange that this made-for-TV series about Jesus would be called The Chosen? I kind of scratched my head about that when I first started watching it. But after watching three seasons of it, I realize that it's largely about the disciples and their experience of being with Jesus. Because they keep on getting worried and upset. And we're watching. They're like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to be worried and upset. But what happens to us in life? We get worried and we get upset. It's about them and the fact that they were chosen by him. It's so important, my friends, that you know that God has chosen you, that Jesus died for you, that it was his choice for you. And predestination is not a concept that we have to get ourselves tangled in. I think what's really necessary is to know that he's chosen us and called us into a great destiny. Let's make it simple. If you truly love God, just realize that it's because God first truly loved you and chose you and has your destiny and destination mapped out. Okay, so powerful action verbs for new, predestined. The third one is justified. As judge, the Father has declared us in the right in spite of our sin because of our faith in Jesus who died to take the power and effect of our sin away from us. It makes us justified. Justified is a, is a, is a legal term. It's a courtroom word. The Bible describes the devil as an accuser, as a prosecutor. But we are to remember that there in the heavenly places there is a section and there are seats for those who have been justified, made unguilty, declared not guilty. And I want you to remember that. There are going to be some very important times in your life when you have messed up and you need to remember that. That Christ has justified you. So put all your weight down on that seat in the section of the unguilty <laughs> in the heavenly places and live accordingly. Okay, action, powerful verb number four, glorified. Why, you know, we the church, we, we're the only ones who use that word, you know. <clears throat> Not anybody else uses glorified. So let's own it, right? Because of our willingness to suffer for the sake of Jesus, God has already qualified us to share in Christ's glory in the future. Let's own it, folks. Remember what Jesus said in the Beatitudes? He said, blessed are you when others mock you and say all kinds of things falsely about you because you follow me. <laughs> Don't let it get under your skin. Rejoice. Be very glad. A great reward awaits you in heaven for in the same way the prophets were persecuted before you. You who put your faith in Jesus, God foreknew, God predestined, God justified, and God has glorified you. That means qualified you, made you qualified to share Jesus' glory. All right. If you got some of those definitions, something a little bit fresh, strong, something that will stick to your ribs and in your heart and in your mind. Okay, now what I want to do as we draw near to the end, <clears throat> I want to paraphrase, going back to verse 22, what Paul is saying and has been saying. So 
if you're, if you're in your Bible, back to 22. This is kind of inspired by the message, but it's, it's my paraphrase. Just listen, okay? All around us, we can see creation struggling in labor. It looks like it hurts, but it's pregnant with hope. The terrible times of pain throughout the world are not tragedies for believers, as we might tempted to be tempted to think. They are birth pangs of a whole new creation, a whole new beginning. These labor pains are not only around us, they're in us. The Spirit of God is stirring in us these days, arousing us deep within to be confident. Our weak and mortal bodies are yearning for a full deliverance into God's full redemption when faith shall become sight and we will see ourselves what we had once merely imagined and hoped for, we will see with our own eyes. It's going to be great. In the meantime, when we get worn out and anxious and then focused, God's Spirit is right alongside us helping us. If we don't know what to pray for or how to pray, it doesn't matter. Just keep focusing on God. The Spirit will quietly move in and pray in and for us and then through us bringing prayers out of our wordless sighs and our aching groans. He knows far better who we are and what we're facing than we do. And he keeps pointing us in the right direction and pulling us back into the presence and the will of God. We can be sure that our Father will weave every event of our lives into something good in the end. God has always known what he's doing. He decided from the outset to shape our lives, that is the lives of those who love him and believe in his son. The son was the first human to be perfectly restored. We're going to be next. We see in him the original and intended shape and purpose and power of being a human. As Jesus is now glorified in a beautifully reflected and miraculous way, we are going to be also. Just like when the rays of the rising sun fill the clouds with color and splendor and depth and beauty. That's the message. Ministers, musicians, please come forward. I have just a few closing words. So what is this saying? It's saying it's going to be okay. And it's not just going to be okay. It's going to be great. As long as we've made Christ Jesus our Savior and the Lord. So in the end, in the end, focus up here, folks. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> Prayer minister. Fo focus up here. In the end. There is no such thing as tragedy for Christians. There's just no such thing. In everything, God works for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. How can God do that? It's because he's a redeemer. It's not that he's going to stop every difficult thing from happening in our lives, but he is a redeemer. Are we always going to know what the next step in our life is? No. But we have been assured of what is going on in our lives. Deep within, God the Holy Spirit is at work with his holy ones. Even right now. Yes, even right now. So, stir up the Spirit Praise your God. Remember what he's done for you. 
Express your love and give thanks to him for all of his mercies. And now we've come to our prayer time. I want you to look at the prayer focus. I want you to pray it. And then I also want you to pray and sigh. Open the deep place in your heart and spirit to God that isn't busy trying to form words. And wait for that silent, gentle voice to speak into you a good, a good word from heaven to pray. And if you want a little help with all that, just, just come forward. One of these beautiful brothers or sisters, they will help you stir up the spirit today. I want to pray our prayer focus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for adorning the gospel of Jesus Christ with so many wonderful assurances. We praise you for the confidence that your word and your spirit renew in all of us who embrace you by faith. You have known us, chosen us, and established our futures to be forever entwined with Jesus. So establish in us deep gratitude for your overwhelming goodness, Father. Amen.